I want to be happy. And I imagine that you want to be happy too. So, what are the ideas that have uh, been suggested over the years uh, that uh, might help us become the happiest people we could possibly be? That's what this video is about. Now, I don't often talk about philosophy because I've, I'm not a huge fan of philosophy as a discipline because most of what I've heard said and, and read written in the name of philosophy has fallen into one of the following three categories. Obvious, so that was a bit of a waste of time, wrong, or, oh, very clever, very clever, I think. Oh, you clever person for writing that. Have a cleverness point, you clever, clever guy. But of what utility was your cleverness to me? Hmm? What, how can I use that cleverness? Does it actually help me in any way? No, it doesn't. So, one of those three categories. But I don't want to dismiss the entirety of uh, philosophy in that way, and so I shall talk about philosophers of old. Um, and I'm going to start with Socrates, or Socrates. You might know him if you've been watching Bill and Ted. Uh, he wasn't the first philosopher, of course. Uh, Heraclitus came before him. Um, and, of course, there would have been philosophers, I'm sure, in the Pleistocene, Stone Age men who held, and women, who held forth to those around them, keeping them spellbound and, 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 and happy uh, as a result. Uh, but they didn't write anything down, so that's sort of irrelevant in the grand history of ideas. So, Socrates. So, who was he? Uh, well, he lived in the 5th century BC in Athens, and he was, so we are told, a short, ugly bloke who walked around talking to people in a way that was, was rather unusual. But he would talk to the sort of people who interested him, who were educated men, and of course in those days educated also generally meant rich, um, and he would say, so, what do you think about such and such a thing then? And they would answer him, and he would say, ah, why do you think that? He would, through discussion, force them to examine why they thought the things that they thought. And, and he would say, so, have you not considered this or this? And why have you dismissed that as a possibility? And don't you think it would be better if you did that? And are you sure that that's really the reason you do it? Know thyself was one of his sayings. Um, and so through discussion, he was getting people to know themselves better. And he was hoping by this means to get them to live happier lives. So how a person should live was something that these men were thinking of. They were, they were philosophers in those days were, were also doing science and they were, they were looking at Oh, all sorts of things to do with thought. Anything you can think about, all the various disciplines that we know of today, they all came under philosopher. Uh, so Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone meant, yeah, the general, the whole bit, the whole of knowledge and science and, yeah, philosophy. So Socrates is kick-starting it, and he had this Socratic method. He didn't himself write anything down, though, but he had a pupil called... Plato, you may have heard of him. He's uh, famous now through the Platonic relationship. Uh, he gave his name to that. Uh, and he founded the Academy in uh, Athens and, and started teaching people more formally. And uh, he was looking for something called eudome, uh, eudom, eudaimonia, uh, which is sort of flourishing happiness. It's, it's lasting happiness. I'm not talking here about, you know, instant gratification, hedonism. No, we're talking about a way of living life such that you get this flourishing and lasting happiness. Um, and he had a number of ideas, one of which was that we should separate the quality that we like from the thing that displays it, and that these are two separate things, and that they are one is an illusion. So you see a beautiful uh, tree, and you think, wow, isn't that tree beautiful? And you might really love that tree, but it's actually better to love uh, and to appreciate something which is timeless and, in Plato's uh, belief, more real. There was a concept of beauty that was absolutely timeless and uh, that existed separate from all the trees. That tree is also beautiful. That woman is beautiful. That building is beautiful. There are lots of things that are beautiful in the world, but there was a concept of beauty that exists you don't need any of them. All those trees could be destroyed, but the concept would remain because that was more real, therefore, than any of those things that displayed that concept. And we should perhaps seek to appreciate those concepts more than the things that display them. Yeah, well, maybe that would help. Um, he taught Aristotle, and Aristotle actually rejected an awful lot of what Plato came up with. He thought that Plato was, was just lost in the heavens. He was, Aristotle was going to be far more down to earth and all this concept of beauty stuff. And um, he founded uh, the Lyceum. 
in 335 BC, a uh, sort of rival school, if you like. So all of these are existing, uh, overlapping in time, uh, but uh, Athens was the, the crucible of things at this point. Um, and uh, he, uh, again, uh, the Lyceum was for men only, uh, obviously, isn't it? Yeah. Happiness is, wasn't for all. Um, the, the sort of the right to happiness was not considered something that everybody should have. It was it was just for the you know the right people, the educated people, the the people at the top of the heap. Um, anyway, uh, he was later, by the way, tutor to uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, that's not relevant. I just will throw that fact in. Um, and uh, only about a third of what he wrote remains to this day, unfortunately. Um, uh, he dealt in an awful lot of topics. Uh, he was big into metaphysics and so forth. Uh, biology is often uh, called the father of biology because he was the first person, so far as we know, uh, to write down a big categorization of all sorts of plants and animals. Uh, a categorization, of course, which has since been overturned by modern science. But nonetheless, the idea of categorizing animals and plants into groups and analyzing them and see how the, they were related um, uh, that, that was uh, the, the first tentative steps in the modern science of biology. Um, but anyway, we're talking about happiness. Uh, he also believed in the five elements. Do you know what the five elements are? Earth, fire, air, water, and uh, uh, ether. Five elements he had. Uh, but you D&D &D fanatics, I bet you, you, you haven't got in, uh, on your, in your bestiary uh, an, an, an ether elemental. Well, maybe you should add one. Stick it in. Um, uh, it's related to vacuum, if you want a weapon for it. Anyway, um, he sought the middle way. So he would define um, something which is bad, like a cowardice. Cowardice is, we don't want people to be cowardly. You don't want a society full of cowardly people. So no, that's, that's a vice, that's over there. Um, but on the other hand, way over there, what's the opposite of cowardice? Well, that would be, it would be just headstrong, reckless foolhardiness. You can't have an entire society where people are like that either. So the middle way would be courage. And he would then almost define that, if you like, as a virtue. If it's the middle between two bad extremes, then it's it, it, call that a virtue. So it's good to be witty. It's good to have a bit of wit, isn't it? Uh, you don't want to be a bore at that end. You don't want to be a buffoon at that end. So wit and um, extreme shyness doesn't really help you in this life. But then Utter shamelessness is not to be encouraged either. How about modesty as a, as a nice middle way? So he was coming up with this idea of try to live your life finding the middle path between the, the extremes which are bad. The excesses in, uh, the, nothing to excess. The, these, these, uh, these excesses, uh, the extremes are to be avoided. Seek the middle way and that was your path to happiness. Was he right? Well, it seems reasonably good advice, don't you think? Although I do wonder whether a lot of these virtues are, as is suggested by the model, smack in the middle. I mean, for instance, if, if cowardice is here and, and recklessness is here, maybe courage is here. <laughs> maybe uh, the, the, this gap is much bigger than that gap and that uh, you know, a danger of courage is it's really close to, to, to recklessness. Um, I, how would you measure? How would you measure? Anyway, I... Uh, I get away from my, my central point. So looking for the, the, the middle way. Um, and uh, he uh, would have peripatetics. Uh, they would wander around. That's what peripatetic, the peripatetic is, is to wander around. So I had, a, I had a peripatetic Latin teacher, for instance, when I was at school. I used to think it's, it makes it sound like he's got a horrible twitch, poor chap. But no, it just meant that uh, my school uh, couldn't justify having its own Latin teacher. So he would teach Latin in several different schools and he would... I'm sure he used a car rather than walking, but he would go from school to school. Uh, so he was a peripatetic uh, Latin teacher. So these peripatetics would wander around discussing and they would say, well, how about this to, to their fellow? And, well, what about that? Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Good point. But wait a minute. Surely that would mean this. Oh, I hadn't thought about that either. Ah, maybe we can put these ideas together and form a synthesis. Ah, oh, I love a synthesis. Um, and so this was, uh, again, an extension of the Socratic method. You wander around and you discuss. And a lot of uh, early philosophy, uh, and, and th this tradition went on for many, many centuries, is written down in the form of dialogue between people. Um, uh, Galileo, Galileo was uh, uh, using it in the Renaissance period, the, the dialogue discussion. Anyway, um, there was a rival. Uh, those were the, the Epicureans. So Epicurus um, is sometimes looked upon these days as a bit of a hippie. Uh, he had a walled off community. Uh, which some people describe um, as way off into the countryside. No, it wasn't. It was halfway between the Stoa, where the Stoics 
later set up shop and uh, the academy was at the Lyceum. Uh, so it was definitely in town, but it was walled off, this garden. Uh, and he had women and slaves and all sorts in his walled off garden and they would cut themselves off from the rest of the world. They were not interested in the world out there. They were just wanted to create their own little world. Uh, it is thought that he might have been a vegetarian. Um, and uh, to modern eye, it does seem that he was a bit of a cult leader. You go, oh yeah, really? Okay, you gotta, you're inviting lots of uh, women and slaves into your uh, walled off garden, are you? Uh, and it's not just the, mo back in the day he was accused of naughtiness going on in that garden. Uh, it was walled off and people couldn't see. Uh, but today, with a modern sensibility, we think it does sound a bit like a cult leader. And one of the things that makes him seem more cult leader is that he would come up with these maxims. And today I've come up with this maxim. It's this. I want everyone to write it down. It's great. Oh, yes, great leader. We think your maxim is terrific. We shall all write it down. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. It was very top down. It was he had the ideas and he told people what they were and they were to learn from him. So it does sound a bit, does sound a bit cult leadery, doesn't it? And, and maxims, slogans, mantras, these things that you repeat, it becomes a little bit sort of uh, hypnotic. It, it does seem a bit culty, doesn't it? It's not just me. Um, anyway, uh, Epicurus came up with the idea of different needs. So um, there are natural needs and there are unnatural needs. Unnatural needs are ones created by man. Uh, so you might have, for instance, that is... Uh, something that is natural and necessary. So we all need food and water, right? So that's natural and necessary. Um, and if you don't fulfill this need, you feel actual immediate pain. If you, if you need a drink, you will feel thirsty. If, uh, you're hung if you're hungry, you will feel the pain of hunger, hunger for lack of food, um, warmth and so forth, these things. But they're also quite easy to satisfy. In the normal course of events, an ordinary person living an ordinary day can get a drink of water, get something to eat and uh, put some clothes on. So job done. Then there are the, the natural but unnecessary needs. So things like vague cravings for things like respect and sex and the like. Um, uh, these are not really necessary and you don't feel immediate pain for not getting them but they're very difficult to satisfy. So that's another category. And then you get the neither uh, natural nor necessary. So these are things that mankind creates. So for instance, the desire for the latest gadget. Oh, I must have the latest gadget. Really? The latest gadget didn't exist a year ago. You weren't craving for it then. Why do you need it? A year ago, you were getting by without the latest gadget. No one else had one. Didn't bother you in the slightest. So why do you need the latest gadget now? Uh, it, it, it is a need which has been created by man through advertising or whatever. Um, and it's not necessary. You don't really need this gadget. And so those are the, the, his three categories. And you may think, wait a minute, surely there's a fourth category, which is the neither natural, uh, not natural, but necessary. Um, but... In the normal course of things, that category doesn't really crop up. I suppose you could contrive that. Everyone must have this identity card or they will be killed. Uh, so that would be something that has been created by man and is sort of now a necessary thing, but only because someone's made it necessary. Um, that's so rare and bizarre. He didn't really bother with that one. So the three needs. And uh, there's that second one is a bit of a tricky one because it's very difficult to satisfy these vague cravings for things that you can't get rid of because it's a natural craving. It's not one that you can say, well, that's just been made up, so I can just ignore it. I can just choose not to have that. I don't, OK, I'm just going to decide not to want that gadget. That's possible, whereas I can just decide not to want to be happy or need any respect. Well, that's, that's something that's very difficult to just decide because we do have an innate nature, I would suggest. Um, uh, so that was the, the, the Epicureans. He also believed in, in atoms. Um, so he was you know, one of the, the early proponents of, of that idea. And he defined good as pleasure and, and bad as pain. Um, which is actually maybe not such a bad definition of good and bad, or good and evil if you prefer. Um, but uh, along came Zeno of Citium. Citium is a place in Cyprus, uh, like loads of... Um, these early philosophers, they were immigrants to, to Athens. Uh, Citium was a um, Phoenician colony, so it is thought that he possibly was Phoenician, but we don't actually know that. Uh, but he got known as, as Zeno of um, uh, Citium, and uh, 
he set up the Stoic movement, um, the movement of the Stoics. They were so-called because of the Stoa. This here is the Stoa of Attalos. It's in Athens. It's a long arcadey thing. Essentially, it's a, a shady, long place that you can stride up and down uh, and get out of the sun because it gets very hot in Greece. Uh, this one was built uh, by the Americans. And I took this photograph myself. Thank you very much. Anyway. Uh, so again, peripatetics, so they would stride up and down this thing saying, so what do you think about this then? Um, and the, uh, the Stoics, um, they had their own uh, philosophy, which again, it largely involved the avoidance of pain and the limitation of desire. If you can limit what you desire, uh, then that in the long term will also mean that you don't end up experiencing so much pain. And absolutely... Uh, central to the idea of the Stoics is a sort of a, a middle point between the thing that happens to you that is bad, or good I suppose, but actually let's just concentrate on the bad because it's avoidance of pain was their main thing. So this thing has just happened <gasps> and then you feel bad. Boom, this leads to that. He said this nasty thing, I am upset. But no, there's, there's a middle point here. He says this nasty thing. I make a judgment of that as nasty. And then that judgment makes me upset. There is this middle point. And we know that there's a middle point uh, because the same stimulus doesn't have the same emotional effect on everyone. So um, somebody says something to a crowd of people. And some of the people in the crowd are, oh, they don't like that. And they get really emotional in a bad way. They get angry or sad or whatever it is. Um, whereas other people in that same audience who heard the same words spoken reacted differently. How can that be? Well, because they, they, they had a different judgment of the, the stimulus that they encountered. So that, that is a central idea of the Stoic. Now, there's this uh, notion of the, the Stoic sage. There wasn't really a Stoic sage. It's a sort of notional being of the perfect Stoic. If you had a perfect Stoic, he would be able to detach himself so much from what's going on that he'd be able to put up with anything. You try to torture him, you strap him to a table and you've got the impaling needles and the branding irons and you get to work with a blowtorch and a pair of pliers. Ha <laughs> ha! And he will be able to think to himself, well, it's not really me they're torturing. It's just my body. You know, and of course that level of detachment is rather difficult to uh, achieve in, in, in real life. But that would be the notional Stoic sage, the, the perfect example. And the Stoics would say, well, if you limit your desires, um, you, you don't need fame and wealth and these things. And you can always recognise this middle juncture, it's your judgement that's actually upsetting you. Then you can avoid... Uh, getting upset by stuff. You can say to yourself, well, you know, actually, um, that's something that I can't really control. Um, so I'll just accept it as fine. If it's not in my control, why get upset about it? And so long term, all going well, happier. Um, now, uh, Stoicism became the dominant philosophy for about 500 years. Um, uh, someone called Cicero, you may have heard of him, uh, he translated the, all these Greek ideas into Latin and popularised uh, them in the Roman Empire. And there are lots of very famous Roman uh, uh, Stoics. You may have heard of Seneca, you may have heard of uh, Epictetus uh, or Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, they are Roman Stoics who developed the idea a bit further. They tend to lay, lay aside all the uh, metaphysics and, and so forth and, uh, and stick more to the how to be happy, how to live your life, how to live a good life, how to become a good person stuff. Um, now, uh, and, and they were very different. Uh, Epictetus was a slave who had once had his leg deliberately broken by his master so badly it left him with a limp for the rest of his life. Uh, but he, hey, you know, well done. Uh, he, he got up and finished fourth. He uh, pulled himself together and became a very prominent and successful Stoic later in life. Uh, Marcus Aurelius became emperor. So he did ever so well. He didn't get much higher than emperor. And he lived in a time of uh, a lot of war. And when uh, he was on campaign for 10 years, he wrote his meditations, which were these really quite admirable books about how we should live. And coming at it generally from a Stoic point of view. So the Stoics were very successful 
for a very long time, but then came a, 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 along a new idea called Christianity, which eventually usurped Stoics and, and stamped on it. The, the Stoics, uh, St. Augustine, for instance, who was a, a Berber from North Africa, um, he became a bishop and uh, he wrote a lot of uh, stuff saying that uh, the Stoics were positively evil. No, 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 no. They're, they're absolutely evil. Um, uh, you don't look in, in yourself for the truth. The truth is, is it's out there. It's out in the world. God created it. Don't not you. You're you're nothing. You're just a you're just a you're just a, you're just a, a mere mortal, a mere a mere human vessel of of, of a soul. Um, and uh, he he concentrates on the here and now. Um, a stoic. So a stoic concentrates on the here and now, whereas he, Thomas Aquinas and the Christian ideas, Christian philosophies that came in were saying, no, 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 the here and now is irrelevant. Don't think about the here and now. The here and now, this, this world is just a, just a temporary passing. It's almost an illusion. It's almost an irrelevance, really. Forget about that. No, 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 no. Pleasure is in the next world. Heaven. That's God's big creation. That's his big project that he's ever so proud of. He's got all the clouds looking really nice. He'll love it. But you get it later. Now, life is just, well, life is suffering, isn't it? But a good Christian embraces suffering and, and by so doing earns, uh, you save up so many suffering and brownie points now that you, oh, you're going to get such a good heaven, you'll love it. Um, uh, so the Stoics uh, were, were, were evil and you shouldn't be thinking about pain and pleasure. In fact, thinking is wrong because Christianity holds all the answers. And as soon as uh, a philosophy says, we now have all the answers and questioning our answers is itself a blasphemy and not to be done, thinking is wrong, it does tend to lead to a certain amount of uh, conservatism of thought. And so nothing much changed for ever such a long time. So I'm now gonna have to press the fast forward button and uh, we get to Thomas Aquinas. And he was uh, writing in the 13th century. Now, Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, who came up with the... Uh, oh, uh, there's also the concept, sorry, um, I was going to uh, talk about was original sin. So there's this idea that we're all born sinners. We're all... We're sin you haven't done anything and you're already a sinner. Um, so it's sort of over for you now in this life, but next life, you'll be fine. Uh, anyway, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, he came across the text of the Stoics, uh, which had been preserved not in Christendom, not in the West, but in the East. And then he translated them and sort of Christianized them a bit to make them more acceptable for, for Christendom. Uh, he had to sort of you know, change a bit here and change a bit there. But yeah, he took on board a lot of the Stoic ideas because that's a rather good idea. That's a rather good idea. Ooh, that's, mm, OK, I'll ignore that one. OK, right. So we've now got Stoic ideas being reintroduced to the Western world and some people, I think possibly, you know, going a bit far here, uh, but some people credit the Renaissance with Thomas Aquinas because you know, he, he, he set the conditions. Because of Thomas Aquinas, it was become, became, uh, become, becoming okay to question the church and maybe start doing stuff like thinking and looking at the way we ought to live our lives and then, you know, looking at these ancient uh, philosophers who also did science and stuff. And, oh, that's quite interesting. And you get the Renaissance. Well, um... I suspect the Renaissance is quite likely to have happened eventually without Thomas, but uh, thank you, Thomas, for at least making it that little bit easier. So, Thomas Aquinas, who was uh, uh, around in the 13th century, um, he rediscovered the Stoics, and he suggested that some happiness, at least, was possible in this life. So, if it becomes possible, then maybe it's a thing we should bother trying to work towards. Um, and that uh, he, he was also the creator of the, the new virtues of faith, hope and charity. You've probably heard of those? Thomas Aquinas. Um, and uh, you could live, you could shape your own life to at least some degree through the application of reason, uh, which was a dangerous but rather important idea. Um, and uh, something which uh, it, it's pointed out in a book, which I'll introduce you to in a moment, is that, although this is something I've heard several times, it's, it's not until you get to the Renaissance that there's a, a new thing in art. You see statues, particularly paintings, smiling. Yes, nobody smiled in, in the art of, the, of the, the, the Christian medieval era. You don't smile. That's, you're supposed to be a, a, a virtuous, suffering soul in this world. You don't smile. But people actually being 
you know, apparently openly, brazenly even happy, is something that you don't get until Renaissance art, which is uh, in itself actually rather sad thought, but there you go. Uh, anyway, um, fast forward again, 16th century, Martin Luther, probably heard of him, and uh, he is the father of the Protestant movement, and uh, he had faith! Faith is the thing, you see, it's all about, uh, it's all about faith, and um, we don't have choice. God doesn't give us a choice. It's not about thinking about that. It's having faith. As long as you have faith, that'll get you to, to, to happiness. And um, hard work as well. Faith and hard work, the Protestant work, work ethic. But he's not saying that you should enjoy your work itself. You don't seek out a job that you enjoy doing. It's, it's by working hard itself. That is the, the virtue. Um, and uh, none of this thinking nonsense. Uh, inter interestingly, uh, Martin Luther actually advised uh, um, Henry VIII, who was thinking of divorcing his first wife because uh, she hadn't given him a, a male heir to take over the kingdom. Um, he said, no, don't, don't divorce your wife. That's wrong. Divorce is wrong. You shouldn't do that. Just take another wife, <laughs> which, which, which he thought was fine. So there you go. Takes all sorts to make a world. Martin Luther, possibly not entirely the guy you thought he was. Um, now, let's go forward now to John Locke. So the Renaissance happened. I mean, it happened in Britain. Yeah, but Britain wasn't really the, the, the crucible of it. That was Italy and other places, um, Spain and, and to some extent Germany. But yeah, uh, the, the Renaissance did happen in Britain, but they... Enlightenment was a British thing, and the Enlightenment was a really big change. That's when science really took off. Um, and uh, John Locke was, uh, was part of that. And he came up with a weird idea, which at the time was genuinely new, but you might not think of it as weird or new, but it's the idea that a part of the purpose of a government is the happiness of the citizens. Yeah, it's actually government's responsibility to make people happy. I mean, actually happy. Of all the other things you, you, the governments are supposed to do, but, sorry, happy? That's another thing we're supposed to do now? Ha really? Okay. Right, but yes, he, he had this idea, and uh, this idea took root, took hold, and by 1776 it was such a strong idea that it was set into uh, the, the, the documents of the founding fathers, uh, the, 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 the founders of the United States, that these truths were considered to be self-evident and that uh, the government and the constitution should be involved with life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Apparently it went from totally new idea to positively self-evident. And in America, um, the idea of equality and life, liberty and pursuit of, of happiness um, got enshrined in such a way that it seems that it led to a lot of unhappiness. Um, in, by the time uh, 18 in, uh, visitors to the USA from Europe uh, went there in 1830, they, they saw an awful lot of discontent there. You see, someone in, back in Europe might be very rich and successful, and someone else might be very poor, but got a decent and honest job, and that might be fine. They could just accept that. Whereas in America, everyone was absolutely vigilant for, oh, my neighbour's got a, an extra thing that I don't have. Why has he got that thing? Why, we must, I must try to get that thing. And, oh, hang on, he's got slightly more than me. He's got slightly more than me. When, when the, the field is more level, the tiniest little bump is really noticeable. And people really pick up on that. And they're constantly monitoring other people jealously for their success. And constantly disappointed. If you put in people's minds the idea that anyone can be president. Wow, you don't have to be born into the aristocracy. Well, if you're American now, do you think you're going to be president? I mean, do you really? What are your chances of becoming president anytime soon? Or at all in your lifetime? What are the chances of your son or daughter becoming president? Probably pretty low, I think you'll agree. And all the people who stand any chance of becoming president, they're all sort of over there, an identifiable group. That lot over there, yeah, the, that elite. They become president. So you've promised you could become president, but then you realise I stand no chance of becoming president. So when you've been promised something and then it turns out to be a sham or you have it taken away from you, that's much worse than never being promised it in the first place. And if you stood no chance of success in that realm, uh, you didn't get jealous of the people who are successful in that realm because didn't, I mean, it makes no sense to be. So it actually seemed to be a recipe more for unhappiness than happiness. 
Although that might be counterintuitive. Life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That sounds really good, doesn't it? But, well, maybe it's not. Um, now, uh, John Locke also came up with another idea, which is the blank slate. And frankly, I wish he hadn't. This the blank slate idea that man is born as a blank slate and then through experience, uh, pursuing pleasure, avoiding pain, he ends up winding through a life of experience and becoming his completed self at some point. Uh, but we're born with no innate traits at all and the science really is in on this one. A lot of people have done an awful lot of work and yes there is such a thing as human instinct. Humans are not born as blank slates. Um, if, you, if you bring up a, a, a baby, in a, this experiment has been done, you bring up a baby in a chimpanzee in the same house, give them the same clothes, exactly the same treatment, the baby, the human baby will not turn out as the chimpanzee. Um, it's, they have an innate nature. Um, but that was another of his ideas, and he was he was trying uh, to help with this idea. But I would like to suggest that that was one of his ideas that really didn't. Sorry, John. Um, but he was at least saying that we are free to choose what we do and question uh, the way things are done and the and the way. Uh, the, the, the attitudes in society and so forth, the values that we are told that we should have, questioning is good. So, you know, well done for, for, for that, John, say I. Um, uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, I've got some dates written here, 1748 to 1832, I can never remember the dates. So, um, he was the, the founder of uh, utilitarianism. And I myself have been described a number of times as a utilitarian, and, and possibly to some degree I am. I've definitely uh, come up with the idea of um, defining good as increasing the total amount of happiness in the world and evil as decreasing the total amount of happiness in the world. So not just for me, you understand, the whole world. Um, and that's very similar to the utilitarian maxim of the greatest good for the greatest number. So yeah, okay, maybe um, there is a little bit of that in me. Um, and uh, that um, the... Um, I don't know, I have to look at my notes again. Uh, Oh yeah, and it, it was just saying that this was um, a time of the Enlightenment, a time of massively increasing wealth and success. Technology was taking off, agricultural productivity, longevity, uh, architecture, town planning, just everything was getting so much better so quickly, uh, thanks to the Enlightenment, um, that it was an in interesting time to be thinking about, so well, how do we get happiness out of all this then? And pleasure gardens were being built and... and um, that seemed to be a, a, a way forward. Oh, well, we can create loads of entertainments using technology. We've got these amazing marbles. There's this, there's this uh, Turkish chess playing automaton thing. It's amazing. Have you seen it? But some people are saying, no, wait a minute, that's, that's blasphemy to say that we are machines, to compare us to that. Anyway, so, um, yes, so Jeremy Bentham, so you, 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 uh, utilitarianism. So now we go to John Stuart Mill, uh, and we're definitely in the, the 19th century now. Now, he put, he, he was saying, don't go, for, don't go for happiness. No, 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 that's, that's a, a mistake. Don't aim for happiness. Instead, liberty. That's the thing. Freedom to choice, freedom to choose. You, want, you should just become the best possible you. And don't listen to those other people who say you should be this or the, this is the, the, the way that all people should be. There is an idealised person. No, no, no. You have your own personal idiosyncrasies, your strength. What am I really good at? OK, develop those. And in a spouse, don't look for a soulmate. Don't look for someone who's just like you. No, 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 no. If anything, look for a spouse who's, got, who's the opposite of you. Um, if you're cheery, maybe they're grumpy. Together, what a team. If she's got that skill set skill set and he's got that skill set together what a team and love the differences learn to love how different that person is from you embrace that embrace your own idiosyncrasies become the best you and embrace the idiosyncrasies of those around you so that they can become the best them that's quite a nice idea i think uh, definitely well meaning uh, so that was john stuart mill and he was saying that um you make yourself useful to society. You become the, the best you. If you can develop yourself to your, the fullest of your potential, you become more useful to your society so everyone gets a that little bit happier. And you will become happy, but not because you pursued happiness itself. If you pursue happiness, um, that will be perhaps to the detriment of becoming the best possible you and learning all those skills and finding the right spouse and all those things. You're just going for happiness. Instead, 
go to be the best you and happiness is just a fortunate byproduct, which all going well, you will experience. Um, uh, so my next note is here, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778. Um, uh, the French Revolution uh, has has uh, the French Revolution is a bit. Hang on, sorry, I've I've, I've lent to the French Revolution. Never mind. Um, Saint Augustine was saying, "Don't think about the here and now because you get your reward in heaven." French Revolution is sort of similar. French Revolution is ah, there will be this idealized republic. Don't worry, that's the ideal that we should all be uh, aiming for. That the future is is great. Uh, heaven is is on earth, and it'll be this republic that we're going to set up. It'll be great. Trust me. So let's just kill a few people first. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau actually opposed the Enlightenment. I know there are always naysayers, aren't there? But he was saying, oh, with all this new technology and all these new gizmos and buildings and so forth, it's it's getting in the way of our authentic selves. Our authentic selves comes from, come from nature. We are natural beings. We have an innate nature and we're becoming an inauthentic modern corruption of that. And we should be going back to nature because nature is good. And uh, therefore, yes, he actually was, was a, 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 an, a, an opponent of the Enlightenment. Um, and, and perhaps as uh, René Descartes should have said, I'm French, Therefore, I'm wrong. Now, it occurs to me uh, that uh, uh, I really should say something about my sponsor. Uh, otherwise, I might not be able to pay my mortgage. Uh, my sponsor is NordVPN. What's a VPN? A virtual private network. It's a way of interacting with the interweb through your browser uh, using um, an intermediary. So um, NordVPN has servers in 60 countries around the world. And you can pretend to be in one of those. You can route your internet shenanigans through one of those, thus appearing to the internet to be in a different country entirely. This has many advantages. You can hide your IP address, which makes you uh, more anonymous and less hackable and impersonatable on the, on the web. You can use Wi-Fi in public places like railway stations and cafes and the like with a, a bit more uh, security and peace of mind as a result. And you can uh, buy games, for instance, if you're a very keen gamer, you could buy some uh, games and download them online from some country where perhaps they're not available where you are, or they're enormously more expensive, annoyingly, frankly, more expensive where you are, or airline tickets, the various things that you can buy abroad uh, which, uh, and, and take advantage of those foreign prices and exchange rates and the like. Uh, and if you were to go to nordvpn.com stroke Lindy Beige, click in the description, you will find their details of an offer. If you get a, a two year plan, you get four months for free. Well, that's got to be good, right? Um, so, as I say, 60 countries and um, I found it very easy to install. And that is saying something. You may say, oh, well, hang on, you work in, in, in YouTube. You're, you, you must be Internet savvy and, and computer literate. Mm, not really. Uh, I tell you, if something involves computers, it usually, and me, it usually involves an awful lot of shouting and frustration. But even I found NordVPN very easy to install. So that is saying something. Um, and uh, with my one account, I can uh, use six different devices uh, with, the, with that service. And uh, uh, you could try it, as I say, by clicking the link in the description. And if you, for some strange reason, decide it's not for you, well, there's a 30 day money back guarantee. So no risk. So pff, click away, I say. Anyway, back to philosophy. So what happens next? Well, one of the movements that, uh, took, uh, that uh, arose in the 19th century is the Romantic movement. Um, you may have heard of Goethe. Uh, what's the difference between... Uh, uh, oh, I've ruined the punchline already. Uh, what's the difference between a Joyce and a Goethe? Well, Joyce wrote Ulysses and Goethe wrote Faust. Anyway, Goethe, Goethe is most famous for uh, writing Faust, uh, the famous story of the man who sells his soul to the devil and uh, on, on balance later regrets it. Um, by the way, if you've ever seen a dramatised version of that, you probably haven't seen a dramatised version of the original, because the original is seriously weird. Almost anyone putting it on stage or filming it now uh, reads the original and goes, I think we'll leave that bit out, because that's just too weird. Anyway, uh, an earlier, well, his first work, which was highly successful, um, was The Sorrows of, Long, oh, the Sorrows of Young Werther. Um, or, or Werther, if you're not very good at German pronunciation. And that was in 1774, so that's what, just two years before America got uh, launched as an independent state. And uh, it, it was this 
heart-rending tale of this love-stricken man who ends up committing suicide. And there was something called the Werther effect. It did apparently uh, cause a noticeable increase in suicides. And even today, when famous celebrities die, particularly if they commit suicide, there seems to be a little rise in suicides that, that follows. People get caught up in this sort of romantic... What is it? Could we use the word ecstasy? Um, well, uh, the Romantics were trying to, if you like, fill the gap. Right, you may have heard of Immanuel Kant. I sort of skipped him out. But anyway, he came up with this idea that science is limited because science can only deal in that which is observable. You, you, if you measure it, it's, it's science. But if it's just this sort of vague concept that you got, no, it just doesn't, yeah, that's not really science. And the Romantics said, we can, we, can, we can fill this gap. We can create art to fill like a proper art. And this is, the year, this is the time when people are building opera houses and celebrating artists who are just artists. They're not also philosophers and scientists and all the rest. Not like Leonardo da Vinci, who did, did the lot and people thought he was a genius because of his amazing uh, skills of inventiveness and so forth, his machines and the like. Good Lord, that's a drawing of a parachute. That'll never work. Oh, it does. Um, but now artists are being held as geniuses even though they were just artists. Oh, he's a genius. Um, and they uh, were trying to fill that gap of, of what, what science couldn't, they thought, give us. Um, and they wanted to create new art in a way that was new. So the old art, that just represented, that was just paintings of stuff paintings, depictions of, of, of reality or whatever. Um, but this new art is created. I would say this is a massive exaggeration. Loads of art. I mean, a lot of uh, uh, the subject matter of ancient art was, was myths and legends. They weren't painting from life. They weren't actually painting dragons and pegasus and unicorns and the like. Um, and the, it can be very interpretive. Um, a lot of Renaissance paintings are quite interpretive of mood and the like. Um, but anyway, they were taken, taken up with this romantic period. And, and uh, uh, in his book... Um, happy, why more or less everything is absolutely fine by Darren Brown, uh, which is a uh, large part of the inspiration for this video. Um, uh, he comes up with this quote, and here's the quote. I've written it down. Uh, the Romantics uh, had a narcissistic exaltation of one's inner experiences. Yeah, sort of slightly overdoing it. Um, I think it's a bit harsh, uh, Darren, to be honest, uh, but I do take your point. Uh, although I'm sure you yourself ex uh, appreciate the irony of someone uh, criticising the Romantic period whilst wearing a velvet jacket. Um, so, uh, in, the, uh, in the Romantic period, they were offering ecstasy for all, if you like. In the past, yes, there was, there was Christian religious ecstasy, but not many people got to experience that, really. Um, whereas anyone could go to an art gallery or you could pay uh, for the cheap seats. You could you, even a poor person could go and see an opera and wow. And as Darren points out, in a hundred years, you go from Bach to Wagner and Bach was very, he was a Christian and he was very mathematical, very methodical, very deliberate. And some people will say, oh, yeah, he didn't know about the maths of his uh, music. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he very definitely did. It's not just modern people reinterpreting and spotting patterns. He knew very definitely about his patterns. And we know that he knew because he used to deliver his uh, pieces of music quite often to people, not in the form of dots and staves that you can put uh, in front of you and then, then play straight away. No, no he would actually deliver a load of mathematical equations that had to be solved such that you could then translate them into the music, write it out, and then play it. He knew exactly what he was doing. It was mathematical. And to appreciate it, you really had to think. Whereas 100 years later, Wagner, bam, bam, ba -dam, bam, bam, wah, ba -dam, ba -dam, wah, it stirred the emotions so that you don't have to. There was no effort to think. It was just, it just blew you out. It's, it's so loud and so, dum, bam, ba -dam, so booming and, and romantic and with people doing all sorts of, you know what operas are like. They're, people are always committing suicide, aren't they? Um, coming, to, coming to strange ends. You see a lot of... Um, old documents listing causes of death and, and holding breath, fainting, grief, and, and all sorts of causes of death that are not considered causes of death anymore. You won't find those on a modern death certificate. Um, anyway, um, 
Christianity was losing its grip. It was uh, 1835 that David Strauss wrote his book, uh, The Life of Jesus, Critically Examined, in which he pointed out an awful lot of glaring historical errors in the Bible and inconsistencies. Well, if that's true, then that bit can't be true. So this Bible thing can't actually be literally all true. Um, and nobody burned him. This was 1835. Now, uh, God hadn't been shot in the head as he was in 1851 by the publication of On the Origin of Species by Darwin. That hadn't happened yet, but already by 1835 it was possible to publish that widely and not be burned. So Christianity was definitely losing its grip on philosophy and people's ideas of what might make us happy and how we should live. Um, and uh, I'm going to Skip ahead now to Karl Marx. I'm sure you've heard of him. There's an awful lot to be said about Karl Marx. He was a weird guy, but there is not time. Uh, for the moment, let's just talk about how he's actually going back in some ways to the religious ideas of Martin Luther and, and Saint, actually Saint Augustine, that heaven's not here and now. We, the people, should, should strive towards this future heaven, this future communist state that's going to be great. And the we may never get there, but the striving to get there will be good. And we'll be getting ever closer and closer to this perfect future state. And the self is irrelevant. Don't think of yourself. You're just no one. You're just one, one puny person in the, the multitude of citizens in the, in the country. And uh, you should be thinking about the welfare of all. It's, it's all of us together. It's the collective good is good. Individual good is bad. Individual wealth is good. Property is bad. Owning stuff is bad. And, and uh, well, we sort of know that, that what this led to didn't turn out all, all that well, generally. Um, but he was very definitely into hard work. A bit like Luther again. And uh, but interesting, he wasn't saying that you should do a job again that made you happy itself. That's a surprisingly modern idea. The idea that we should uh, have a job that we actually enjoy doing and even taking it further that we are a failure if we don't enjoy the job that we do. Actually, quite a modern idea. So if you are in a job that you don't do, maybe just by working hard at it, you get something out of it that way, maybe. Um, Anyway, uh, the, uh, let's go to Friedrich Nietzsche. So uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, German philosopher, and uh, he's talking about how we create ourselves again, going back to that idea. So there's these two uh, ideas in opposition. We create ourselves, um, the, ind the individual is relevant, ind idiosyncrasies uh, are relevant versus we don't create ourselves, we are perhaps a blank slate or we are insignificant or we should try to uh, head towards uh, a generalized ideal. Uh, so these are opposing ideas. And uh, I'm going to, sorry, there's a note here, was it? Oh, right. That's right. He was talking about how Nietzsche again, how we must not deny the animal in ourselves. We have an innate nature, uh, which uh, here I believe that Nietzsche is correct. We, we are born with an innate nature, not as a blank slate, uh, as uh, John Locke was suggesting. And instead, we should not deny that. And we should make our decisions in the light of the fact that we have an animal nature, a dark side, if you like. Um, Talking of dark side, Sigmund Freud. And now Sigmund Freud is often uh, called the father of modern psychology, and I think that's not unfair. Um, he was asking an awful lot of the right questions, and he did do uh, quite a bit of good, one could say. Before Freud, if you were seriously a bit of a nutter, you could very likely end up in an asylum, and that might be, that's it, you for the rest of your life. You're just in an asylum. Yes, there were some people working in asylums to, uh, to cure or treat the people there, but not very hard, not very many, and not very scientifically. And after Freud, the idea of locking people away in asylums uh, was considered quite abhorrent, and we don't do much of that anymore. And instead, if you are um, going mad, there are lots of people who will try to help, try to treat you. So that's good. So he uh, boosted our empathy. So that's good. And he was asking a lot of the right questions. Uh, and he also put a lot, uh, spread a lot of the idea of the, uh, the subconscious. Now, the subconscious, he didn't invent the idea of the subconscious. Schopenhauer, 50 years before, was writing about it, although he didn't use the term. Um, and even the subconscious in the ancient Greeks' uh, works is, is alluded to. But he put much more emphasis on it and spread the idea very widely that there is this subconscious. Unfortunately, 
it has to be said that Freud was, in pretty much all of his conclusions, wrong. I mean, spectacularly wrong. Uh, I went to a, a meeting of a psychology society recently, uh, based at the university, and they had uh, pictures of <laughs> pictures of Freud that we were invited to tear up and throw darts at because he was so wrong. And it it pains me when I come across people who think, "Oh, I'm really getting into psychology. I've bought this book on Freud." And I think, "Oh no, don't read Freud. Read read almost anything more modern than Freud." And because yeah, so Freud came up with all this dream interpretation nonsense he came up with. Um, so yeah, conclusions wrong, but he was asking the right questions, and at least he did have uh, some empathy. And uh, his uh, therapeutic success was pretty dismal. Most of his patients really didn't get any better, but at least he was trying. Um, and uh, he um, he saw the world as uh, he saw the, the 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 general nature of humans as being unhappy. The the default state he saw as unhappiness. Um, I think he's wrong there. I think I think we we, we vary. I think some people are naturally more cheery than others. I, I wouldn't say that the that unhappiness is a default state, and I don't think it's a, a particularly helpful way of approaching things to imagine. Right, at the starting point, we're all naturally uh, screwed up. And something that's really bad about Freud is that he started this modern uh, obsession with having something to blame, particularly having someone to blame. So why are you unhappy in this way? Oh, it's because oh, this happened at school, or your parents were like this. And having someone to blame doesn't make you happier. Um, so great, here you are, unhappy, and now you, you, you've learned, according to your therapist, that the reason you're unhappy is that something 20 years ago happened to you. Well, it happened 20 years ago, you can't go back and change it, you don't have a time machine, and the people who did it to you are now dead, or whatever. Um, tough, what are you going to do? So you've now got a recipe for resentment, um, and what are you going to do? Just live the rest of your life unhappy because of this thing that happened that you can't change. Ugh. Blame doesn't really help. Um, and... Uh, no, I can't, I can't come back to that, actually. So um, there are a few other unhelpful ideas that have been knocking around. So there was someone, for instance, in the in the USA in the mid 19th century um, uh, who reveled in the name of Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. What a name. What a fantastic name. Um, but he was a bit of a charlatan. He was into mesmerism and the life. And he was the founder of the New Thought Movement, um, which was... <laughs> A narcissistic exaltation of one's personal significance, you might say. Um, it came up with this idea, which you think would not take root. You would think it would only only convince the most drooling of imbeciles. But a lot of people who were at least approaching average intelligence got taken in by this idea that if you want something enough, the sheer wanting of it and picturing it, the universe will bend to your will somehow and deliver it to you. Well, if you get taken in by the idea, I suppose it is quite appealing. Oh, wow, I can have anything I want just by wanting it a lot. Oh, brilliant. Um, built on the, the same idea was the, as the, um, the prosperity gospel, which I believe started in Dallas. Um, and uh, in this, uh, there were Christian churches and they would say, well, give your pastor, pastor, um, your, your clergyman, your, the leader of your congregation, just give him money and he will spend it ostentatiously, which will somehow inspire you to give him more money uh, because God will make sure that uh, if you give money to the church, then the universe will give money to you and somehow you will end up fantastically wealthy. And guess what? It doesn't work. Yep, doesn't work. Um, Faith healing and all this sort of thing sets people up for disappointment. If you've got a faith healer, oh, we can heal. They never pick someone, of course, who's got no legs or whatever, because, oh, his, his legs have grown back. No, they haven't. Uh, they always pick some invisible uh, ailment, something that people are just going to, oh, apparently he feels much better now. You don't, there was a mysterious pain in your belly and now you're not feeling it. It's amazing. Now, you can hypnotise someone, you can mesmerise someone into not feeling pain through the placebo effect and other things. Um, but it never lasts. If you think, oh, oh, I'm going to become wealthy because of my belief in this thing, um, then ultimately you are going to be disappointed. Uh, that ailment that's been troubling you is going to come back. Um, and they will always be able to blame you. It's always your fault. Uh, you didn't have enough faith. You didn't donate enough money. You didn't believe hard enough. Uh, whatever it is, it's blaming on you. So then you end up 
you've failed, you've invested all that time, money, effort and, and, and belief in whatever system it was, and it hasn't delivered, so it was all for nothing, and now what do you do other than be miserable? So blame culture, yeah, I would suggest, doesn't really help. Um, so what does? Well, um, something that's developed since the 1990s, well, it, its roots are earlier, but it got really going in the 1990s was something called evolutionary psychology, which looks, it accepts that we have an innate nature um, and says, well, it, way we should find out what that nature is and then try and live um, getting the best out of what we know to be our actual natures. And that seems to be pretty good. And there is an evolutionary psychology form of, of talking therapy where you say to people, um, Oh, someone will come to you and say, uh, I'm incredibly shy. Oh, really? OK, right. Well, we could find someone to blame in your past, but that's not going to help. Or we can say, well, maybe you're just naturally shy. In fact, for some things, they can even do genetic tests. Well, let's have a look at your, your, your genes. OK. Oh, right. You've got 17 copies of that gene at this place on your on your chromosome number 17 or whatever. And um, yep, that's straight, very strongly associated with people being painfully shy. So there you go. It's probably just you. You don't have anything to blame for it. So that's your innate nature. Maybe embrace that and be the best shy person that you can be. And maybe that is a, a more practical way uh, to be towards um, becoming happier. And it seems, what, what science uh, that I, I, I've read, it seems that this is the case. It's more effective. Um, there's someone called Daniel uh, Kahneman, uh, and he's still alive, actually. And he came up with this idea of the experiencing self versus the remembering self. And maybe we should pay more attention to the remembering self. So the experiencing self, that's the here and now. So there you are, trudging up a mountain. Oh my goodness, it's cold. Your feet are killing you, they're so cold. And your left boot is rubbing really painfully. And this, you can't see a thing, it's a foggy cloud up there. Why did you agree to come on this mountaineering trip? What were you thinking? That's your experiencing self at the time, suffering. You're remembering yourself a year later, sitting with his feet up in front of the fire, nice cup of cocoa, talking to his friends. Ah, oh, went on an amazing trip. Oh, wow. God, it was tough, though. I remember we got so cold. We got so really so cold. My feet really hurt. Oh, it was fantastic, though. I'll definitely do that again. What? They've done experiments where they, they get people to plunge their hands into extremely cold water, which is really painful, and hold it there for 60 seconds. Ow! Ow! And after 60 seconds, whew, they can take their hand out and they're given a towel. OK, great. And then uh, another time, they're given a very similar test. But this time, it's a little bit different. They plunge their hands into 60 seconds of exactly the same temperature of water. It's exactly the same experience that they suffer, but there's more! And it's worth. They have another 30 seconds up, uh, on top of that. But the water's not quite as cold. So what happens is they go, ow, ow, God, and they think about last time, this hurt last time, ow, ow, and then after a bit, oh, oh, hey, I'm, I'm lasting longer, I'm lasting longer, and oh, do you know, I'm starting to get used to it, it's not so bad, actually. Oh, yeah, hey, wow, I'm, maybe I'm tougher than I thought, and uh, uh, okay, and oh, finally, they're allowed to take their, their hand out. They've suffered half again as much time. And it was still suffering in, in cold water, just not quite as bad at the end. But now they've got a story. Now they've got a story. Oh, I suffered the pain for quite a while. But actually, it's, you know, I'm quite pleased with myself. I lasted longer that time. And um, I was beginning to, get, uh, beginning to get used to it towards the end. So, you know, ah, not, not, not bad. And then they're given a choice. We're going to do one of those two tests again. Do you want to do the first one or the second one? Almost everyone, about 80% of people, Pick the second one, even though it is objectively worse for the experiencing self. But for the remembering self, oh, it was better, partly because it had a happier ending. And, and how something ends up is largely how we remember something. So almost any amount of suffering um, is remembered as sort of good, as long as it leads to something where you become stronger and a better person and feel better about yourself. And it ended up in this case, not even well, just not as badly as you were expecting. Um, so perhaps we should focus on nurturing the remembering self. Do things now so that in the future, our remembering self, because you do something bad now, and that remembrance of it will last for the rest of your life. You can ex experience something that, that you suffer one day, and for the rest of your life, you're able to do that. You, you, you train for that marathon, and you complete that marathon for the rest of your life. You're someone who's run a marathon. Um, acts of kindness, for instance, 
it's been shown that the pleasure you get from an act of kindness lasts much longer than the pleasure you get from someone being kind to you. So you could be a grumpy git who thinks the world's just rubbish and people are awful and, oh yeah, the, the, that time where that guy picked up that thing and said, oh, have you dropped this and ran after me? Oh yeah, sorry, did I drop that? Thank you very much. Oh, that was quite nice of him, wasn't it? Yeah, it's quite rare that, isn't it? Isn't it terrible? That that shouldn't be the exception, should it? But that, that really is the exception. Most people are rubbish. You can go straight back to being your grumpy self. Whereas if you are kind to someone else, you teach yourself something about yourself. You are kind and they thank you. And and the, the, the pleasure of being kind lasts longer. So be kind. Anyway, I've said rather a lot about this topic. I am going to say more. There is uh, one of these branches of philosophy that I'm going to return to, and it's the Stoics, because perhaps the Stoics have the most to tell us today about how best to live our lives. But that's for a future video.